President Joe and fellow Rotarians, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mayor Skip Henderson. Well, that was, um, of all the introductions I've had, Judy, that was certainly one of them. Um, I, I will tell you that I try to learn a little something every day. Um, and I've just learned never to let you give an introduction for me again. <laughs> Obviously, I'm kidding. I, yeah, that's, I'm not sure where you got all that, but I'm, I'm sure my family is laughing somewhere. But, uh, but I, I will tell you, all kidding aside, um, it, is, it is really a pleasure serving with Councilor Thomas. I've had that privilege now for a number of years. And with her as budget chair, uh, I think there could not be a better, uh, better representative who would be watching over our budgetary issues as we work through this pandemic. So, uh, and I, I tell you what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try to hit on a lot of these topics kind of very, uh, just, just from a 30,000 foot uh, level because my sincere desire is to try, to try to talk about things and provide answers to any questions that you have uh, as Rotarians. Um, I, I, I want to make sure that if we're touching on some of these topics, that they're things that are pertinent to you. So uh, I will tell you that um, top of mind everywhere is COVID. Um, our numbers, uh, to keep it short, our numbers are as high as they've been. Uh, our hospitalization rate is about 40% higher than it was during our surge in July, which was pretty doggone high. I will say that uh, I, my, my, um, the esteem in which I hold our hospital staffs uh, has not, done nothing but grow because they have become so efficient and effective at, at treating the individuals with COVID that they are not staying as long uh, in the hospital as they did during those early days. Um, the vaccine, and this is kind of a tricky topic because people are really anxious. They're very frustrated that they can't get uh, access to some of the uh, to, to vaccination. And I think it's important to note that we're really still kind of on track. I mean, if you look back three months, even six months ago, um, their projections were that the vaccine would be readily and widely available, uh, probably in the spring, maybe even the summertime. And it could be as late as, as the fall of 21 before everybody who wants the vaccine can get it. So we're still kind of on that track. Uh, tier 1A has been uh, hospital, frontline hospital uh, workers, healthcare workers, uh, it has been our first responders, as well as our law enforcement officials. Uh, anybody living in a, a an assisted uh, care home uh, and anybody 65 years of age and older. But to put it in context, our health department has been sort of quarterbacking uh, the, the access and the distribution of the vaccine. They've had almost 20,000 uh, people register for the vaccine. They've only received 800 doses. Uh, so uh, there's a couple of things I know for certain. One is if you want the vaccine, you're going to be able to get it. Um, but a couple of things that, that I, I don't know is when and at what location. Uh, we're working very closely. We've been fortunate in Columbus that we've had an opportunity to be taken into the confidence of the governor uh, to some degree. Uh, we are working uh, with a GMA, a Georgia Municipal Association sponsored advisory committee. And I was fortunate enough to sit on that committee and, and uh, along with about 18 or 19 other mayors and it gives us a, a, a sort of a, a conduit, if you will, as we work through GMA to provide the governor with some instant feedback and some of the things that we're, we're needing assistance with. Uh, the governor's been responsive. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we did have a little glitch in trying to get all of the second doses that we needed, and, uh, and I reached out to his office, and that, that was taken care of. So the, the, the necessary uh, amount of vials that we need to at least give the second doses to people that have already received it uh, is, is on its way. Uh, there has been a financial impact. <clears throat> you know, we, we, I've said many times that this pandemic is a medical emergency that has created some mighty big financial challenges. Columbus, Georgia has been very fortunate. Uh, just as we have probably fared better than most cities our size, uh, with regards to the numbers uh, and the number of people in, in infected with COVID-19. Likewise, we have been very fortunate in the way our revenues have been impacted. Now, I don't say that uh, with a blind eye uh, towards our small business people because a lot of those folks are really struggling. 
and we are working with those individuals to try to try to find ways to help make it a little bit easier for them to kind of keep keep working and keep keep moving down the road until this pandemic is behind us. Uh, our hospitality industry has suffered, uh, but uh, but as far as our sales tax and uh, other other uh, occupational taxes and things of that nature, uh, we are actually a, a little bit ahead of where we were last year. Um, so that bodes well for our, our planning for our budget uh, issues. Uh, Councilor Thomas and, and the budget committee, which is com comprised of the entire council, uh, will will fortunately, at least at this point, not have uh, a, a really steep hill to climb. We're still watchful. We're still being very, very, uh, very careful about how we expend any of our funds because we still have we still have some more tunnel to go through before we get on on the other side. Uh, but right now uh, we are uh, able to try to provide some assistance. Uh, to some of our small businesses. One of the things we're trying to do, we're taking a look at every tax, every every uh, permit that that our small businesses um, have to pay for, and we're, we're evaluating how many of those we can delay without re restricting our ability to provide services to the citizens. So we're looking at ways to try to soften the blow this year to try to help them get through that, that area. We are hopeful that the new administration will uh, come up with, uh, there's been, been uh, some indication there may be some stimulus funds available for, specifically for small businesses. Lacking that, we're gonna look and see what, if anything, we can do to try to, to, try to help bridge them to a, uh, a, a better, better time when we're, we're post-COVID. Um, we, um, we're also working with our restaurants. You know, Columbus has really done a great job, uh, or very, Kind of organically, we've grown some some terrific restaurants. Uh, we've got a a great restaurant scene, and people are starting to take notice out in, in around the region. They're coming into Columbus to check it out. Um, we've met with uh, some of our restaurant owners uh, and just had sort of a roundtable, and we decided to try to pool the collective talents of these individuals and give them a forum to share some ideas on on how they're coping with some of the challenges. That they are, that they are being being um, their meeting right now. Um, so we're. I, I can tell you right now. I was asked by one of the restaurateurs, uh, "Do we have any plans to do any more closing of businesses or temporary shutdowns?" And and I can tell you from my perspective, no. Uh, our our company took a shot, and these small businesses took a a heck of a shot. So as long as we're getting our business community to help us. By, by adhering to the governor's orders, um, then no, we're not we're not planning on any any shutdowns. I think that would be that would be disastrous. Um, also, in in the uh, midst of all this, we um, our citizens expect and they should expect us to continue to provide services. Uh, and I I said before the call when I was talking to President Joe and and Cam that uh, uh, what we have known. Uh, all along, it's it's kind of fun watching the community find out, and that is just how incredible uh, our employees are with the Columbus Consolidated Government. Through this pandemic, <clears throat> they've been coming to work, they've been getting the job done, and there have been glitches, there always are, uh, with, with an organization the size of, of the Columbus Consolidated Government that provides so many different services. Uh, so we... Um, we just we just very proud of the way they have responded to some of these challenges, and we're also very grateful for the way our community has responded to these challenges. Uh, the only way we are really going to be able to mitigate the spread of this stuff is if we all work together. And and the folks in Columbus have just done an incredible job. Uh, private uh, companies, philanthropic organizations, and just people who live next to elderly people have all pitched in to try to do what they can to try to make this a little bit more tolerable for the, for the folks who live in this community. So it's, it's just been kind of a, 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 a real blessing to, for us to be able to watch that, watch that take place. Um, we're, we're still dealing with some other issues. Uh, our violent crime was higher last year. We had more murders than we had had uh, the, the previous year. Uh, most of those are relational. Uh, you can't blame them all on COVID, uh, in my opinion. I think it's just the fact that we are seeing more and more uh, young people uh, having access to guns. 
So we have two new chiefs. Uh, we, we hired, uh, I appointed a new fire chief and also a new police chief. And Chief Blackman at the police department has got a plan that he and I have been looking over and working on that are gonna uh, try to take on some of these challenges within, within our community to, to make sure that the folks that live here are safe. Um, you'll be seeing more and hearing more about that. Uh, he'll, he will probably roll that out just within the next couple of weeks. Um, but speaking of, a, of a, a, the chiefs, we had two kind of milestones, uh, almost historic in, in the way they came about. Uh, our fire chief was not promoted from within. We looked for the very best individual we could find despite outstanding talent that currently was within our fire department. Uh, chief Sal Scarpa stood, stood out and he has done some amazing things. He has really uh, hit the ground running and, and, and has been doing some good things in our fire department, fire and EMS. Uh, and of course, Chief Blackman uh, is the second African-American police chief uh, in, in uh, our city's history. And then what he did was promote two females to the highest positions just below his. They are his assistant uh, chiefs. Uh, and that's, that's a first for Columbus. So, so we're just, we're excited about, uh, about the, the uh, organizational chart within our police department. We're excited about uh, being able to do the things necessary to make sure that everybody uh, is safe. Um, we are continuing to work on some of our housing issues. You know, we put about a million dollars into the budget and to council's credit, they left every nickel in and this was back in 19 and we were able to tear down some real eyesores and some blighted areas and basically crime magnets, uh, areas where people would hang out and get up to no good. Uh, and, and then of course, with the COVID budget, uh, we were, uh, we were in sort of uncertain times but council still allowed us to place $250,000, a quarter of a million dollars to continue our efforts to get rid of this, uh, this dilapidated housing and try to make our neighborhoods uh, a source of pride for folks that live there. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm ask Cameron, I know Cameron has been um, probably receiving some questions. I can go deeper into any of these items that you like, uh, but uh, I would really rather, um, deal with any questions and make sure I'm focused on the things that you guys want to want to hear about. Well, thank you so much, Mayor. I, I'd just like to begin by thanking you again for your service. Uh, I think you've been prayed for a lot throughout the year. This uh, uh, 2020 and, and the, the term you've, uh, you've been serving is unlike anything that you imagine you signed up for <laughs> when you ran for mayor. And, and I know that uh, you know, being mayor is 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 tough, and it has challenges and opportunities that come with it. But like like every industry sector, and and even in our personal lives, this this has uh, really just rocked our world uh, in, a, in an unprecedented way, as has been uh, noted many times throughout 2020. So just thank you for embracing it with uh, with the heart that you have, and and with the work ethic that you have, and uh, as always. The citizens' best interest in mind. You you work hard for us, and we appreciate you very much. And thank you for your time today. Um, the first question we have is about that uh, that beautiful building over your right shoulder. Uh, <laughs> can you give us an update on the government center? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Uh, we are still. I mean, we're still very much committed to uh, keeping our promise to the citizens, and that is to try to create a safe environment for them to come to. This is their government center. It's not ours. And uh, so we're, we're actually gonna begin with uh, some meetings uh, with counselors and with the designers to try to get back on track. We, we kind of delayed that for uh, about eight months simply because we, we knew how tight a financial uh, situation we were in for the average homeowners. And taxpayers were uncertain about the future, about what was gonna happen as a result of COVID. So we. We can only really accomplish this, or at least in our estimation, the best way to accomplish it would be with a sales tax, a local option sales tax, or excuse me, a special purpose local option sales tax. Uh, and it just wasn't, in our, in council's opinion, and in my opinion, it just wasn't the right time to be asking folks to consider uh, another sales tax on themselves. Uh, so we are in the process of, um, of moving forward with site selection. We've, uh, we've got to do some refining of the estimates that we have seen come in. Uh, 
because it's, I mean, it's obviously a major endeavor. And we're looking at everything. We're looking at uh, constructing a uh, two separate buildings, having a general government and a, a, uh, a judicial building. We're looking at both on-site, maybe one or more off-site. We're even looking at some, it, whether or not there are existing buildings that might suit uh, suit our needs. So we'll have it we'll have it pretty pretty finely pinpointed. I'm certain from council uh, just within the next several months. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next next question we have is uh, economic development question. How how are we continuing to leverage tax tools such as uh, the TADs and opportunity zones to uh, continue to spur economic development in our city? You know our our chamber of commerce and our development authority does a great job. I mean it's been a it's been a tough time to try to attract businesses to come into your community over the last year, but. Uh, but what they have succeeded in doing is is they have created an environment that uh, gives our our corporate uh, citizens a lot of confidence. I mean, we we know we're going to have some issues due to the pandemic where people are restructuring or downsizing or even closing plants. We just saw uh, with Campbell's uh, uh, just the other day. But we've also had uh, companies like uh, Kaiser Warren and uh, PathTech. Who have expanded and and are are creating more than 600 new jobs. Uh, so right now the TADs uh, I think are are have been a very attractive method to in, enhance the type of development that people are are, are wanting to uh, wanting to see. Uh, we've got one TAD that will absolutely transform uh, the space between the new hotels that are going in downtown. Uh, you know we. We came into this pandemic, we had a ton of momentum, and it just kind of all put the brakes on. You know, we had three hotels under construction in, in downtown Columbus, uh, or excuse me, in uptown Columbus, and, uh, and we still have construction going. One is going to have a ribbon cutting uh, probably just in the next couple of weeks. Um, but the TAD is going to allow them to make an access that, that connects Broadway with Front Avenue and do it so that it's it's more than just an alley it's a sense of place they'll have a uh, you know chairs and tables and they'll have planners and it's going to really really look nice uh, we've got another tad that we're entertaining out in midland uh, for uh, for a major development going on out there uh, and there's another tad uh, in the uptown area uh, that is going to be an incredible development so um we're seeing people uh utilize some of these tools to uh, to, to invest in Columbus. And I, I left off the, one of the, what I think is gonna be one of the cooler ones, and that's over there at the corner of uh, 13th and 2nd and 1st, uh, or 2nd and 3rd. And there, there's gonna be a tad there that uh, uh, Chris Woodruff is putting an amazing development out there that's gonna really kind of expand the, uh, uh, the edge of where Uptown begins. So it's, there's a lot going on. Uh, we, we want to continue to spread the word about what an incredible place Columbus, Georgia is. Uh, we were just named, um, I think two weeks ago, as one of the 25 coolest places to visit in 2021. Uh, so, uh, and we were, we were ranked in number 11. So we've always known we were a cool place to be. Now the folks are finding it out as well. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you for that, that update as well. Uh, switching gears, uh, Rick Nuremberg is asking, what, what can be done uh, to address the violent crime problem and specifically the, the, the murder rates? I don't yeah. know. That. Yeah, you know, the, the, the thing is you can't hit that from just one direction. There's, there's a number of different angles we've got to take. Uh, the city manager and I authorized uh, uh, some money that would be matched by a, a philanthropic organization in town to bring in a, uh, a, a program called Cure Violence. Uh, it's, it, it was pioneered in Chicago, uh, and they're coming in, going to do an assessment of the community and kind of let us know what the cost would be, and, and uh, we can make a determination. Cedric Hill and Reggie Williams uh, and actually Dr. Hiltz from uh, the health department are all working on this. Uh, we've we've got a lot of programs in place. Uh, we spent over the last three years about two point three million dollars on mentoring organizations, on um, uh, tutoring assistance, on GED programs, on workforce development. 
So we've got the, the opportunities for some of these young people to take advantage of. What's missing, I think, is to have the kind of individuals that can sp speak with them with credibility. Maybe somebody that's walked the same crooked path and found their way back uh, to a, a, uh, a, a good quality of life and, and a, a respectable, uh, respectable uh, way of, of running their life. So if we can get them connected with these individuals, we think that we can kind of let them know about these options and make it clear to them that if they make a conscious decision to continue down the path they're on, we'll bring to bear every resource we have on shutting them down. Uh, we are also looking at and evaluating the value of cameras, uh, putting them in some areas and posting signs where there's 24 seven surveillance. Uh, we've talked to some other uh, uh, states and cities that have done this and they've seen up to a 40% reduction in violent crime. So we're, we're gonna continue to provide opportunities for these, these, pe these young people to choose a, a straighter path, uh, but we're also gonna hold them accountable. Uh, we're gonna work with our new DA. We're gonna make sure that if they are picked up with a weapon, that those sentences will run, uh, they'll, they'll run consecutively, not, not concurrently. So we're, we're working on it. Most of, most of the crime that we have had in Columbus, probably 75 or 80% has been relational. People that know each other, either domestic violence or it's some type of drug deal or somebody selling a gun. And then when they get there, uh, the seller of whatever the item is decides they want both the money and the merchandise. And it ends up, and then you have the retaliatory issues where somebody else comes after them. Uh, our police chief has got a, as part of his six month plan, uh, he has got a plan to take his command staff and go out in the neighborhood, knocking on doors, introducing themselves to the people that live in these neighborhoods and trying to encourage them to let them know if they hear anything. There's a gap right now. Uh, we'll have 10, 12 shots fired. By the time our police get there, miraculously, nobody saw a thing. So we've got, to do, we've got, some, we've got some relationship mending to do with people in our communities, particularly people in our black and brown communities. Uh, and our police chief has a plan for creating opportunities for our community to sit down and talk to our police officers and kind of get to know each other as human beings and, and stop viewing one another in, in adversarial roles. Uh, so we've, we've got a lot of things that we are intending to put in, in place. Uh, our police chief has got a, a number of great ideas from a 21st century policing model that he, he ascribes to very closely. And uh, we're looking forward to trying to see that, that uh, the, the, these, these initiatives take, take, uh, take our crime rate back down. Well, that, that is a tough issue. And thank you for that, that thoughtful and, and thorough answer to a pretty you know, a broad question. Um, it, it is a, a real challenge and we appreciate that update. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were running out of space at the landfill. What's uh, the latest with that? And have we evaluated providing incentives for recycling? Yeah, we're, uh, you know, of course, this year has not been a good year to try to make, uh, make any significant improvements because it's become much more difficult with the people staying at home. There's, there's a higher tonnage rate that's going into our landfills and to, into recycling. Uh, and with the extra work and wear and tear on our vehicles, we've had a bunch of them that have just not been able to be operational. And then, okay, in addition to that, with the virus, we've had some workers that have not been able to ride. So we've fallen behind in some areas. We haven't quit working. We worked on Saturdays. We worked on Wednesdays, which are typically our catch-up day. And we've had them work until 7, 8 o'clock at night trying to get the stuff picked up. Um, we were very close to, uh, to maybe having about 10 years left on our landfill. But with, uh, with, with council's foresight, they, they uh, approved uh, spending uh, $350,000 to apply to the EPD for a change in the way, believe it or not, the way we terrace some of the areas in our landfill that we cover. And that alone added another 20 years to our landfill. It allowed us to keep some of those cells that we were gonna to have to shut down. It allowed us to keep some of those open simply by changing the way we, we do things. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a credit to our public works department because they're continually looking for ways to try to, try to handle it. But I will say on a personal note, 
no landfill process is eternally sustainable. Uh, so we've got to continue to look for new industries, new ways to try to deal with some of our refuse. We got about 57,000 single family homes in Columbus that we pick up. And we pick up really four days a week because you've got recycling, you've got your trash pickup, you've got your uh, the, the yard waste, and you've got bulky goods as well. So we are going to continue to push people to recycle. We're, we're trying to make it easier for them to do that. We're trying more educational programs. Uh, but yeah, we've, that's something that we never quit working on is how do, we, how do we prolong the life of our landfill and shift some of that burden uh, to, um, to uh, other, other processes. All right, thank you. The, um, uh, another question, can you, can you expand a, back, to, back to COVID-19? Can you uh, expand a little bit on the communication channel between your office and the governor? Uh, and how the state mandates and the city mandates are are really almost uh, in real time uh, reconciled. Yeah, you know we've we when, when the governor started his executive order, we actually had, had stepped out in front of the governor at least in Columbus. We were, I think, one of the second. I think we were the second community in Georgia to take any kind of action. We did some very difficult things that that run contrary to everything I believe in, but we did it to try to err on the side of safety. Uh, and we did, we closed gyms, we closed uh, personal service industries, hairstylists, barbers, uh, we, we, uh, we shut down nightclubs, we, um, we asked res restaurants to do takeout only. Uh, so we, we made some, we, we took some very, very tough steps. And then the governor came in probably two weeks later and issued the shelter in place order. We have decided in, in, that we're not going to put laws on the books that are uh, illegal to enforce. So when people were talking about a mask mandate at the time, the governor, uh, his order did not allow for that. So we continue to use messaging and, and trying to encourage our folks to stay six feet apart, wear a mask if you can, wash your hands frequently, pay attention to your body if you feel bad, stay home. Uh, and frankly, from treating our, our residents uh, as adults, <laughs> that worked. We lagged behind most of the cities our size in, uh, in a positivity rate. Um, but when the governor did allow us to issue a mask mandate, uh, if we met a certain guideline, there was a tier we had to hit. We had to be, uh, we had to be over 100 cases per 100,000 individuals over a two-week period. And we pushed through that middle of August, put it in place, and we actually brought it all the way back down to about 73. So we, we didn't pull it off. We just suspended the enforcement of it. Uh, and then when we got back above that 100, we put the mask, back in, mask mandate back in place. We work very closely with the governor's office. Uh, we do so through our health department folks, through the CDC, and also through the governor's office itself. We also work with GMA. GMA and ACCG have kept us completely informed on any options that we we had, and and what the likely uh, what the likely success or failure of those options was showing in other parts of the country. So I, I feel very good that we've had all the adequate all the information that we could possibly need to make the decisions that we had to make. Um, so, and, and we're still we're still communicating. As I mentioned, I texted the governor the other day to try to speed up the delivery of the second phase of the um, of the of the vaccine, and he responded immediately. So he's he's been, as far as we're concerned, he's been very responsive to uh, anything that we've asked asked them to consider. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, switching switching gears again. Will the city have any involvement with the uh, renaming of Fort Benning? We really don't. Uh, I've actually, I actually spoke with General Donahoe about this. Uh, he's, he is quite a guy. He's, he's doing a, a fantastic mm -hmm. job out at Fort Benning. Um, but we don't have any input. Uh, that's strictly a DOD question. It's going to take place up. At, it's really not even the general's uh, uh, decision. It's going to take place up in in, uh, in the Secretary of the Army and up in up in uh, Washington, 
Um, but you know, I, the only thing, the only reason that I would I would say that I, I kind of hate to see a change is is strictly personal history. I mean, Fort Benning is the reason I'm here. My dad was stationed here when I was born. Uh, but I understand that uh, we we have uh, for years. I couldn't tell you who General Benning was. I didn't know what he had done or what he hadn't done, and from a historical perspective. And I think when you do take a look at the fact that um, uh, some of the activities that uh, it took place uh, under General Benning's uh, uh, tenure, um, it's not a, it's not a good message. And and when the general and I have talked, when General Donahoe and I spoke, uh, he was pretty plain spoken about his support of the Secretary of the Army if they decide to change the name of Benning. Well, thank you. Well, we, we are uh, just about at, at one o'clock right now, and I appreciate that this has been a, a, a pretty vast discussion. We've covered a number of topics, uh, and, and again, we're just so grateful to you for your leadership and uh, for this update and, uh, and for your time today. So I'm going to turn it back over to President Joe, and thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate you all very much.